Redeployment by Phil Cly. We shot dogs, not by accident. We did it on purpose and we called it Operation Scooby. I'm a dog person, so I thought about that a lot. First time was instinct. I hear O'Leary go, Jesus. And there's a skinny, do skinny brown dog lapping up blood the same way he'd lap up water from a bowl. It wasn't American blood, but still, that's the dog. There's that dog lapping it up. And that's the last straw, I guess, and then it's open season on dogs. At the time, you don't think about it. You're thinking about who's in that house, what he's armed with, how he's gonna kill you, your buddies. You go block by block, fighting with rifles good to 550 meters, and you're killing people at five in a concrete box. The thinking comes later when they give you the time. See, it's not a straight shot back from war to the Jacksonville Mall. When our deployment was up, they put us on TQ, this logistics base out in the desert, let us decompress a bit. Not sure what they meant by that, decompress. We took it to mean jerk off a lot in the showers, smoke a lot of cigarettes and play a lot of cards. And then they took us to Kuwait and put us on a commercial airliner to go home. So there you are. You've been in a no shit war zone and you're sitting in a plush chair looking up at a little nozzle shooting air conditioning thinking, what the fuck? You've got a rifle between your knees and so does everyone else. Some Marines got M9 pistols, but they take away your bayonets because you weren't allowed to have knives on the airplane. Even though you've showered, you look all grimy and lean. Everybody's hollow eyed and their camis are beat to shit. And you sit there and close your eyes and think. The problem is your thoughts don't come out in any kind of logical, any kind of straight order. You don't think, oh, I did A and then B and then C and then D. You try to think about home and then you're in the torture house. You see the body parts in the locker and the retarded guy in the cage. He squawked like a chicken. His head was shrunk down to a coconut. It takes you a while to remember Doc saying they'd shot mercury into his skull, and then it still doesn't make any sense. You see things, you saw the times you nearly died. The broken television and the Haji corpse, eye colts covered in blood, the lieutenant on the radio. You see the little girl, the photographs Curtis found in a desk. First had a beautiful Iraqi kid, maybe seven or eight years old, and bare feet and a pretty white dress like it's first communion. Next, she's in a red dress, high heels, heavy makeup. Next photo, same dress, but her face is smudged and she's holding a gun to her head. I tried to think of other things, like my wife, Cheryl. She's got pale skin and fine dark hairs on her arms. She's ashamed of them, but they're soft, delicate. But thinking of Cheryl made me feel guilty. And I think about Lance Corporal Hernandez, Corporal Smith and Eicholtz. We were like brothers, Eicholtz and me. The two of us saved this Marine's life one time. A few weeks later, Eicholtz is climbing over a wall and Sergeant pops out a window, shoots him in the back when he's halfway over. So I'm thinking about that. I'm seeing the retard, the retard and the girl and the wall Eicholtz died on. But here's the thing, I'm thinking a lot. And I mean a lot about those fucking dogs. And I'm thinking about my dog, Vicar, about the shelter we got him from, where Cheryl said we had to get an older dog because nobody takes older dogs. How we could never teach him anything. How he'd throw up shit so he shouldn't have eaten in the first place. How he'd slink away all guilty, tail down and head low and back legs crouched. How his fur started turning gray two years after we got him. And he had so many white hairs on his face it looked like a mustache. So there it was, Vicar and Operation Scooby all the way home. Maybe, I don't know, you're prepared to kill people. You practice on, on man-shaped targets so you're ready. Of course, we got targets they call dog targets, target-shaped delta. But they don't look like fucking dogs. And it's not easy to kill people either. On a boot camp, Marines act like they're going to play Rambo, but it's fucking serious. It's professional, usually. We found this one insurgent doing the death rattle, foaming and shaking, fucked up, you know? He's hit with a 762 in the chest and pelvic girdle. He'll be gone in a second, but the company XO walks up, pulls out his K-bar and slits his throat. Says, it's good to kill a man with a knife. All the Marines look at each other like, what the fuck? Didn't expect that from the XO. That's some PFC bullshit. On the flight, I thought about that too. It's so funny, you're sitting there with your rifle in your hands, but no ammo in sight. And then you touch down in Ireland to refuel. And it's so foggy, you can't see shit, but you know, this is Ireland, there's gotta be beer. 
And the plane's captain, a fucking civilian, reads off some message about how general orders stay in effect until you reach the States and you're still considered on duty. So no alcohol. Well, our CO jumped up and said, that makes about as much sense as a goddamn football bat. All right, Marines, you've got three hours. I hear they serve Guinness. Ooh, fucking rah. Corporal Wiesert ordered five beers at once and had them laid out in front of him. He didn't even drink for a while, just sat there looking at him all happy. O'Leary said, look at you, smiling like a faggot in a dick tree, which is a DI expression Curtis loves. So Curtis laughs and says, what a horrible fucking tree. We all start cracking up, happy just knowing we can get fucked up, let our guard down. We got crazy quick. Most of us had lost about 20 pounds and it had been seven months since we'd had a drop of alcohol. McManigan, second award PFC, was rolling around the bar with his nuts hanging out of his camis, telling Marine, stop looking at my balls, faggot. Lance Corporal Slaughter was there all a half an hour before he puked in the bathroom with Corporal Craig, the sober Mormon, helping him out. And Lance Corporal Greeley, the drunk Mormon, puking in the stall next to him. Even the company guns got wrecked. It was good. We got back on the plane and passed the fuck out. Woke up in America. Except when we touched down in the Cherry Point, when we touched down in Cherry Point, there was nobody there. It was zero dark and cold and half of us were rocking the first hangover we'd had in months which at that point was kind of a sh kind of shitty that felt pretty fucking good. And we got off the plane and there's a big empty landing strip, maybe half a dozen red patches and a bunch of seven tons lined up, no families. The company guns said that they were waiting for us in Lejeune. The sooner we got the gear loaded in the trucks, the sooner we see them. Roger that. We set up working parties, tossed our rucks and sea bags into the seven tons. Heavy work and it got the blood flowing in the cold. Sweat a little of the alcohol out too. Then they pulled up a bunch of buses and we all got on, packed in, M16 sticking everywhere, <clears throat> muzzle awareness gone to ship, it didn't matter. Cherry Point to Lejeune's in about an hour. First bits through trees, you don't see much in the dark, not much when you get on 24 either. Stores that haven't opened yet, neon lights off at the gas stations and bars. Looking out, I sort of knew where I was, but I didn't feel home. I figured I'd be home and I kissed my wife and pet my dog. We went in through Lejeune's side gate, which is about 10 minutes away from our battalion area. 15, I told myself, way this fucker's driving. When we got to McHugh, everybody got a little excited. Then the driver turned on A Street. Battalion area is on A, and I saw the barracks and I thought, there it is. And then they stopped about 400 meters short, right in front of the armory. I could have jogged down to where the families were. I could see there was an area behind one of the barracks where they'd set up lights and there were cars parked everywhere. I could hear the crowd down the way. The families were there. But we all got in line thinking about them just down the way. Me thinking about Cheryl and Vicker. And we waited. When I got to the window and handed in my rifle though, it brought me up short. That was the first time I've been separated from it in months. I didn't know where to rest my hands. First, I put them in my pockets and I took them out and crossed my arms. And then I just let them hang useless at my sides. After all the rifles were turned in, first sergeant had us get into a no shit parade formation. We had a fucking guide in waiting, waving out front and we marched down A Street. When we got to the edge of the first barracks, people started cheering. I couldn't see them until we turned the corner and then there they were, a big wall of people holding signs under a bunch of outdoor lights. And the lights were bright and pointed straight at us so it was hard to look into the crowd and tell who was who. Off to the side, there were picnic tables and a marine and woodlands grilling hot dogs. And there was a bouncy castle, a fucking bouncy castle. We kept marching. A couple more marines and woodlands were holding the crowd back in a line. We marched until we were straight alongside the crowd. And then first sergeant called, to us to a, called us to a halt. I saw some TV cameras. There were, lots of, there were a lot of US flags. The whole McManigan clan was up front, right in the middle, holding a banner that read, Ooh, Rob, Private First Class Bradley McManigan, we are so proud. I scanned the crowd back and forth. I talked to Cheryl on the phone in Kuwait, not for very long, just, hey, I'm good. And yeah, within 48 hours, talk to the FRO. He'll tell you when to be there. And she said she'd be there, but it was strange on the phone. I hadn't heard her voice in a while. Then I saw Eichholz's dad. He had a sign too. It said, welcome back heroes of Bravo Company. I looked right at him and remembered him from when we left. And I thought, that's I Colts' dad. And that's when they released us and they released the crowds too. I was standing still and the Marines around me, Curtis and O'Leary and McManigan and Craig and Wiesert, and they were rushing out to the crowd. 
The crowd was coming forward. Ike Holtz's dad was coming forward. He was shaking the hand of every Marine he passed. I don't think a lot of guys recognized him and I knew I should say something, but I didn't. I backed off. I looked around for my wife and I saw my name on a sign, Sergeant Price, it said, but the rest was blocked by the crowd and I couldn't see who was holding it. And then I was moving toward it, away from Mike Holtz's dad who was hugging, who was hugging Curtis. And I saw the rest of the sign. It said, Sergeant Price, now that you're home, you can do some chores. Here's your to-do list. Number one, me. Number two, repeat number, two, number one. And there holding the sign was Cheryl. She was wearing cami shorts and a tank top, even though it was cold. She must have worn them for me. She was skinnier than I remembered, more makeup too. I was nervous and tired and she looked a bit different, but it was her. All around us were families and big smiles and worn out Marines. I walked up to her and she saw me and her face lit. No woman had smiled at me like that in a long time. I moved in and kissed her. I figured that was what I was supposed to do, but it had been too long and we were both too nervous and it felt just like, it felt like just lip on lip pushed together. I don't know. She pulled back and looked at me and put her hands on my shoulders and started to cry. She reached up and rubbed her eyes and then she put her arms around me and pulled me into her. Her body was soft and it fit into mine. All deployment, I'd slept on the ground or on canvas cots. I'd worn body armor and kept a rifle slung across my body. I hadn't felt anything like her in seven months. It was almost like I'd forgotten how she felt or never really known it. Now here was this new feeling that made everything else black and white fading before color. And she let me go and I took her by the hand and we got my gear and got out of there. She asked me if I wanted to drive and hell yeah, I did. So I got behind the wheel. A long time since I'd done that too. I put the car in reverse, pulled out and started driving home. I was thinking I wanted to park somewhere dark and curl up with her in the back seat like high school. But I got the car out of the lot and down the queue. And driving down the queue, it felt different from the bus. Like, this is Lejeune. This is the way I used to get to work. And it was so dark and quiet. Cheryl said, how are you? Which meant, how was it? Are you crazy now? I said, good, I'm, I'm fine. And then it was quiet again and we turned down Holcomb. I was glad I was driving. It gave me something to focus on. Go down this street, turn the wheel, go down another, one step at a time. You can get through anything one step at a time. She said, I'm so happy you're home. And then she said, I love you so much. And then she said, I'm proud of you. I said, I love you too. When we got home, she opened the door for me. I didn't even know where my house keys were. Vicar wasn't at the door to greet me. I stepped in and scanned around and there he was on the couch. When he saw me, he got up slow. His fur was grayer than before and there were weird clumps of fat on his, leg, these, on his legs, these little tumors that labs get, but that Vicar's got a lot of now. He wagged his tail. He stepped down off the couch real careful like he was hurting. And Cheryl said, he remembers you. Why is he so skinny, I said, and I bent down and scratched him behind the ears. The vet said we had to keep him on weight control and he doesn't keep a lot of food down these days. Cheryl was pulling on my arm, pulling me away from Vicar, and I let her. She said, isn't it good to be home? Her voice was shaky, like she wasn't sure of the answer. And I said, yeah, yeah, it is. And she kissed me hard and I grabbed her in my arms and lifted her up and carried her to the bedroom. I put a big grin on my face, but it didn't help. She looked a bit scared of me then. I guess all the wives were probably a little bit scared. And that was my homecoming. It was fine, I guess. Getting back feels like your first breath after nearly drowning. Even if it hurts, it's good. I can't complain. Cheryl handled it well. I saw Lance Corporal Curtis's wife back in Jacksonville. She spent all his combat pay before he got back and she was five months pregnant, which for a Marine coming home from a seven month deployment is not pregnant enough. Corporal Wiesert's wife wasn't there at all when we got back. He laughed, said she probably got the time wrong and O'Leary gave him a ride to his house. They get there and it's empty. Not just the people of everything, furniture, wall hangings, everything. Wiesert looks at the shit and shakes his head and starts laughing. They went out, bought some whiskey, and got fucked up right there in his empty house. Weiser drank himself to sleep, and when he woke up, McManigan was right next to him, sitting on the floor. And McManigan, of all people, was the one who cleaned him up and got him into base on time for the classes they make you take about don't kill yourself, don't beat your wife. And Weiser was like, I can't beat my wife. I don't know where the fuck she is. That weekend, they gave us a 96, and I took, I took on Weiser duty for Friday. He was in the middle of a three-day drunk, and hanging with him was a carnival freak show filled with whiskey and lap dances. 
Didn't get home until four after I dropped him off at the slaughter's barracks room and I woke Cheryl coming in. She didn't say a word. I figured she'd be mad and she looked it, but when I got in bed, she rolled over to me and gave me a little hug, even though I was stinking of booze. Slaughter passed Weiser to Addis. Addis passed him to Greeley and so on. We had somebody with him the whole weekend until we were sure he was good. When I wasn't with Weiser and the rest of the squad, I sat on the couch with Vicker watching the baseball games Cheryl taped for me. Sometimes Cheryl and I talked about her seven months, about the wives left behind, about her family, her job, her boss. Sometimes she'd ask little questions, and sometimes I'd answer. And glad as I was to be in the States, and even though I hated the past seven months, and the only thing that kept me going was the Marines I served with and the thought of coming home, I started feeling like I wanted to go back. Because fuck all this. The next week at work was all half days and bullshit. Medical appointments to deal with the injuries guys have been hiding or sucking up. Dental appointments, admin. And every evening, me and Vicar watching TV on the couch, waiting for Cheryl to get back for a shift at Texas Roadhouse. Vickard sleep with me, Vickard sleep with his head in my lap, waking up whenever I'd reach down to feed him bits of salami. The vet told Cheryl that's bad, but he deserves something good. Half the time when I pet him, I'd rub up against one of his tumors and that had to hurt. It looked like it hurt him to do everything, wag his tail, eat his chow, walk, sit. And when he'd vomit, which was every other day, he'd hack like he was choking, revving up for a good 20 seconds before anything came out. It was the noise that bothered me. I didn't mind cleaning the carpet. And then Cheryl would come home and look at us and shake her head and smile and say, well, you're a sorry bunch. I wanted Vicar around, but I couldn't bear to look at him. I guess that's why I let Cheryl drag me out of the house that weekend. We took my combat pay and did a lot of shopping, which is how Americans fight back against the terrorists. So here's an experience. Your wife takes you shopping in Wilmington. Last time you walked down a city street, your Marine on point went down the side of the road, checking ahead and scanning the roofs across from him. The Marine behind him checks the windows in the top levels of the buildings. The Marine behind him gets the windows a little lower and so on down until your guys have the street level covered and the Marine in back has the rear. In a city, there's a million places they can kill you from. It freaks you out at first, but you go through like you were trained and it works. In Wilmington, you don't have a squad. You don't have a battle buddy. You don't even have a weapon. You startle 10 times che checking for it and it's not there. You're safe, so your alertness level should be at white, but it's not. Instead, you're stuck in an American Eagle Outfitters. Your wife gives you some clothes to try on and you walk into the tiny dressing room. You close the door and you don't want to open it again. Outside, there's people walking around the windows like it's no big deal. People who have no idea where Fallujah is, where three members of your platoon died. People who have spent their whole lives at white. They'll never even get close to orange. You can't until the first time you're in a firefight or the first time an IED goes off that you missed and you realize that everybody's life, everybody's life depends on you not fucking up and you depend on them. Some guys go straight to red. They stay like that for a while and then they crash, go down past white, down to whatever's lower than I don't fucking care if I die. Most everybody else stays at orange all the time. Here's what orange is. You don't see or hear like you used to. Your brain chemistry changes. You take in every piece of the environment, everything. I could spot a dime in the street 20 yards away. I had antenna out that stretched down the block. It's hard to remember exactly what that felt like. I think you take in too much information to store, so you just forget, free up brain space to take in everything about the next moment that might keep you alive. And then you forget that moment too and focus on the next, and the next, and the next for seven months. So that's orange. And then you go shopping in Wilmington unarmed and you think you can get back down to white? It'll be a long fucking time before you get down to white. By the end of it, I was amped up. Cheryl didn't let me drive home. I would have gone 100 miles per hour. And when we got back, we saw Vickard thrown up again right by the door. And I looked for him, and he was there on the couch trying to stand on shaky legs. And I said, God damn it, Cheryl, it's fucking time. She said, you don't think I know? I looked at Vicker. She said, I'll take him to the vet tomorrow. I said, no. She shook her head. She said, I'll take care of it. I said, you mean you'll pay some asshole 100 bucks to kill my dog? She didn't say anything. I said, that's not how you do it, it's on me. She was looking at me in this way I couldn't deal with, soft. I looked out the window at nothing. She said, you want me to go with you? I said, no, no. Okay, she said, but it'd be better. She walked over to Vicar, leaned down and hugged him. Her hair fell over her face and I couldn't see if she was crying. And then she stood up, walked to the bedroom and gently closed the door. 
I sat down on the couch and scratched Vicar behind the ears and I came up with a plan. Not a good plan, but a plan. And sometimes that's enough. There's a dirt road near where I live and a stream off the road where the light filters in around sunset. It's pretty. I used to go running there sometimes. I figured it'd be a good spot for it. It's not a far drive. We got there right at sunset. I parked just off the road, got out, pulled my rifle out of the trunk, slung it over my shoulders and moved to the passenger side. I opened the door and lifted Vicar up in my arms and carried him down to the stream. He was heavy and warm and he looked my face as I carried him, slow, lazy looks from a dog that's been happy all his life. And when I put him down and stepped back, he looked up at me. He wagged his tail and I froze. Only one other time I hesitated like that. Midway through Fallujah, an insurgent snuck through our perimeter. When we raised the alarm, he disappeared. We freaked, scanning everywhere until Curtis looked down at this water cistern that had been used as a cesspit, basically a big round container filled, quarter, filled a quarter way with liquid shit. The insurgent was floating in it, hiding beneath the liquid and only coming up for air. It was like a fish rising up to grab a fly sitting on top of the water. His mouth would break the surface, open for a breath, and then snap shut and he'd submerge. I just couldn't imagine it. Just smelling it was bad enough. About four or five Marines aimed straight down, fired into the shit, except me. Staring at Vicar, it was the same thing. This feeling like something in me is going to break if I do this. And I thought of Cheryl bringing Vicar to the vet of some stranger putting his hands on my dog and I thought I have to do this. I didn't have a shotgun, I had an AR-15. Same basically as an M16, but I've been trained on. I've been trained to do it right. Sight alignment, trigger control, breath control. Focus on the iron sights, not the target. The target should be blurry. I focused on Vicar, then on the sights. Vicar disappeared into, disappeared into a gray blur. I switched off the safety. There had to be three shots. It's not just pull the trigger and you're done. Got to do it right. Hammer pair to the body, a final well-aimed shot to the head. The first two have to be fired quick, that's important. Your body is mostly water, so a bullet striking through it is like a stone thrown into a pond. It creates ripples. Throw in a second stone soon after the first, and in between where they hit, the water gets choppy. That happens in your body, especially when it's two five, five, 556 rounds traveling at supersonic speeds. Those ripples can tear organs apart. If I were to shoot you on either side of your heart, one shot and then another, you'd have two punctured lungs, two sucking chest wounds. Now you're good and fucked, but you'll still be alive long enough to feel your lungs fill up with blood. If I shoot you there with the shots coming fast, it's no problem. The ripples tear up your heart and lungs, and you don't do the death rattle, you just die. There's shock, but no pain. I pulled the trigger, felt the recoil, and focused on the sights, not on Vicar, three times. Two bullets tore through his chest, one through his skull, and the bullets came fast, too fast to feel. That's how it should be done, each shot coming quick after the last, so you can't even try to recover, which is when it hurts. I stayed there, I stayed there staring at the sights for a while. Vicar was a blur of gray and black. The light was dimming. I couldn't remember what I was going to do with the body. <laughs>